<coughs> Thanks. Well, I've got to follow that. <laughs> Do you have energy? Uh, I've got energy. <coughs> I thought that was really good, and I thought the morning was really good too. Um, I also think that we need to get into some of the issues that have been raised <coughs> quite precisely because uh, what we're beginning to hear is a lot of kind of issues to do with care, unevenness of the city. I think there's something interesting that's come out about frameworks of existing structures and the potential to occupy those, whether an urban or building scale. So I'm, this is my hors d'oeuvre if we're talking about food, um, <clears throat> or amuse-bouche, you could say, uh, so far. But what I want to do in this very... It's 25 minutes, not 30, is it? What, yeah. What I want to do is to give you a few slices of some thoughts um, that have come out of our work and the work of our students. Uh, and then I want to touch on four projects quite speedily, not too much depth. Uh, and first of all, I just want to kind of explain this term, rea reality sandwiches. <clears throat> that I sort of thought had something to do with this interest in the existing city. Uh, and sometimes you have to step away from your own practice or praxis to see the way other people see things. And I like the fact that Alan Ginsberg saw William Burroughs' comment about naked lunch and he somehow had to come up with reality sandwiches, which he didn't understand what he meant. But what I see in this short poem is that he's looking for things to be the way they are. So a prison and a flower are prisons and flowers, and he's looking for something that has directness. Allegories are so much lettuce, don't hide the madness. And I liked the interest in straightforwardness and rawness and nakedness and directness because maybe what was said earlier about how architecture is often quite complicated, and it can be complicated, uh, there's something wonderful and um, exciting, and perhaps a privilege, uh, to be exposed directly to your own city, its conditions. Um, we try and do this in various ways. This was our students drawing with their left hand to document Berlin, which we went to recently. And interestingly, these were the best drawings they did, uh, I think, you know, they were all good drawings, but because they had to draw, and I think they were all right-handed, um, they had to draw in a way that was thinking harder about what it was they were selecting to draw, and therefore more purposefully, and therefore the drawings had more to say. They weren't just shapes of things. Uh, and a walk took the form, took the urban form of a fence, whereas if it hadn't flooded in Raynham, you wouldn't be doing this. <clears throat> Drawing from memory is something we've done with our students in order to see how far, if you imagine where you've grown up and you remember where you lived and you draw, where the memory runs out is where the shape of your significance is, at least at a certain level, take an urban form. And Carving through a city, walking around, the privilege of being an architect is to walk and to look and to think uh, and to observe, as other speakers have all been articulating amazingly well, that there are things that you can find without judgment, without hierarchy, which have value, which you can articulate and which you can use. And maybe it's used and we don't have to reuse, or maybe the reuse is us. You know, we're the ones reusing, whereas people before used. It's the same sign, it's the same bollard. This drawing was celebrating a kind of Tesco car park, <clears throat> which, which I've always loved. It was done a few years ago, but I've never seen a student draw a Tesco car park quite like this. And drawing the section of the city with care in Brazil uh, means that you're documenting the city in section as a spatial, <coughs> spatial agent. And documentary is maybe something to think about, that, of course, the city isn't a fact. Just because you're documenting it doesn't mean that it existed in that form until you set it out in that way. So you've got some responsibility to actually portray the city. When you observe the spatial urban role of trees, you may not be seeing the thing that was 
thought about when those trees were planted. And if you design, as has been discussed earlier, good thresholds, public and private, those, I think, are completely fundamental. They're not the buildings, they're not the spaces, they're the juncture, they're the interfaces, and they are the stuff of cities, and so we love to think about those. What's nice about this particular example is that the lobbies go ridiculously deep into the building. Uh, so they start to stretch. How far can you stretch a fence? How far can you stretch an entrance lobby? That generosity that uh, uh, Simon and Stephen were showing earlier with their lobbies, um, I think that's a... And, and Stephen was showing with the, with the spaces under buildings. I do think there's something in that. I do think that we've forgotten what public space looks like and we should push harder for that, understand how places get used. Uh, if, you un if you do that, if you look... Uh, then you start to be able to make these judgments as an architect, but also with all these other people that Tim were talking about. A lot of this is about case making. You have to persuade your client, you have to persuade other people that the things you want to do are worth it. And to do that, you have to explain it, you have to articulate it, and you have to believe it, and you have to draw it. Um, always loved this student sketch, which just took, uh, takes the uh, materials of a footway napped flints maybe, or maybe they're sets, or maybe they're cobbles and granite curbs, and then lifts them up into a building. Might be quite nice to do one of those one day. This was drawn by a student who hated Croydon when she started looking at it. Um, she was really allergic to it or something. I mean, it was uh, <clears throat> quite extreme. And she came around to enjoying the tessellated tiles that she was seeing there, and she started to feel at home. And the thing with her was the scale was horrendous, but by making the floor civic in this way, she started to acclimatise herself to the place as it existed now in a way that she could become intimate with and understand the scale of. And I thought that was an incredible turnaround. Um, and I, I suppose it's been said a number of different ways, but when you design, I think you also take responsibility for what's next to what you're designing. So we're literally designing what's already existing by being next to it or we should think along those lines. Um, so <clears throat> our practice and our teaching um, covers a kind of urban architectural public realm land landscape threshold. When we started, we kind of started from the big and we worked towards the small. So we didn't do little buildings that got bigger. We, we went straight to the city and got lost. Um, one reason for that, I think, is that it's uh, there's nothing better than having a project where you don't know what the brief is and you can find it through conversation. And this was one of those. This was Wood Green. This diagram shows you the different funding clients, totally different regimes, different maintenance uh, 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 management uh, plans and uh, different time frames of being developed. And so there's a kind of um, microcosm of what the city is doing. It's absolutely diverse in its uh, communities, different in, in its funding, different in its uh, maintenance. And so that constraint and that kind of crazy context gives you some license to think freely. We wouldn't really have dared to suggest cladding this library, over cladding it and putting some planting on it, given that our job was to do the public realm. But because we could talk about this building as a piece of public realm, beautiful building that pulls out from behind the the shop fronts, it starts to create a space halfway along Wood Green with a sign designed with Alex Rich. Uh, and then further down the road, we're working with the shop traders to uh, celebrate the food, build upon the culture of the um, long strip of shop fronts there and to start to kind of make large signs like a large uh, uh, what is that? It's a melon, isn't it? <clears throat> There's a very food-related theme going on here. Um, big signs. And this was coming, this sign here came from a discussion with the vicar who said he wanted a new fence. Um, uh, what came out of that was that we could make a sign that pointed you towards the new river that wasn't far away. It's also a beetle farm. Overcladding the pub on the corner. I mean, it's a bit like you're making this up as you go along, and, and it sounds slightly audacious to say we're going to kind of re, 
reinvent something or overplay something, overclad something. But there's a freedom in that, which certainly for us has taught us how we can design buildings in ways which are contingent on various aspects of a brief, various uh, parts of generosity and other parts where, as Stephen Bates was saying earlier, maybe it doesn't matter. And I think that framework between it's crucial and it doesn't matter is, is a brilliant one. So here, it really mattered that we could see the pub. It didn't necessarily matter that we couldn't afford to upgrade the whole building. But we did also think that we could make a pub garden in a street by echoing the Victorian uh, entablatures and columns and pilasters and kind of pull those out as secondary echoing pieces and then dig the ground up and then widen the footway and narrow the carriageway with the traffic engineers. We also, going a bit far really, allowing ourselves to imagine that once um, acorns rolled down from the ancient woodlands uh, in wood green. And you know, you can get a bit lost, but nevertheless, they haven't been stolen and sawn off like I thought they would be, they're still there. And they're bronze. And we, we used granite curbs. I think the granite curbs are like, they're like antiques in the road. They're hundreds of years old. They're absolutely, they're from Scotland, were these days more from China, not so long ago from uh, other European countries. They're becoming a bit of a kind of unnoticed uh, antique, uh, unnoticed prize. And I think we have to be careful with them because they're beautiful pieces of stone. So we, we're batching them in car park, in the shapes of a car park car parking laybys. We're storing them under cars is what we're doing. <laughs> Work out what to do with them later. And then here we're using the kind of paving uh, that is standard for the local authority, Haringey, but doing it in a pattern because then from the crossing you can walk down to the bus stop, past the Weatherspoons in the cinema, and get a sense of civility and, and civic kind of pride without overdoing it. And these were lights, high rays, uh, high ray lights, um, not uh, made here, they're made in Europe. We chose those with Decca because they had a kind of, um, no one wants to have, no one wants to have um, fun thrust upon them. Uh, and yet that happens with banners quite often. People are forced to think they're having fun. And at the same time, the municipal standard maintainable highways lights are often so dismal that you feel that something's been lost. So we felt this struck the balance of pleasure, belief in the kind of civic uh, quality uh, with these bell-like lights. And then in the evening, lights hanging from the trees uh, are something you can see from the bus. So that, that was a kind of long street, and there's a lot more to that. I, I mean, there's like 56 different projects. Some of them delivered, some of them not. I like, uh, like, you know, leaves on a tree or fruit on a tree it sort of keeps going as long as you want it to go but the important thing is that the strategy was that the high street connected together which gives you uh, a robustness a framework to feel that as if if you only do one thing in that strategy it's still good uh, Frampton is um, a housing project you saw this earlier with Simon's uh, lovely buildings we're showing those here in orange uh, and the building we're working on is in the darker red. There's two buildings actually here. Um, I don't know whether we're going to afford to do the one on the left because it's taken so long to develop that things have got more expensive as we've waited. Um, housing takes such a ridiculously long time. And yet, if I turn that the other way around, maybe it's good that housing takes a long time because we try to get it right. The problem is that everything's getting too expensive to do anything. But then the answer to that <clears throat> is that we... <coughs> explain that uh, things cost a certain amount of money and we fund it. <laughs> I don't know why local authorities and other clients and commercial clients don't understand that it costs more to upgrade an existing building than to build a new one, and that's okay. Let's put the money in, because it will last a long time. Uh, anyway, we'll talk about that later. But this is ongoing, and so what we're doing now, because we waited a long time, is to actually get some more units into the building so that we can actually afford to build it. We got planning permission for it. Um, and as Simon pointed out earlier, <clears throat> this estate was, um, yeah, I'll show it in a minute, uh, bombed. But what's particularly interesting, it wasn't just bombed. In rebuilding it, there was this attitude to 
providing more space with more housing. That's a great idea, isn't it? You build more housing and you get more space. Uh, whereas often on other projects, if you build housing, there's less space and then people want to stuff loads of trees into it to mitigate it. Whereas actually this was an attitude of increased quantity. And what that meant is that you get these really large spaces, not always well used. You get this big skirt around the edge uh, of the estate there and you get some big courtyards in the end and you get these slack spaces, deep spaces, which run between the buildings. So there's a sort of ambivalence that you saw earlier as well with these big loose courtyards which have this um, balance between being contained and overlooked, which they're not entirely, uh, and um, completely um, put to the back of something without any overseeing. And that's not, a, that not, not the case either. There's a kind of uncertain back and front to all of this, which keeps things in a surprisingly successful equilibrium. People like to live here. People identify with these names of the streets. They kind of, um, you realise that actually the structure is the names. It's not so much the shape always. Um, as part of this project, we thought that there weren't many women as part of, <laughs> part of this uh, identity. And there are some amazing women who have done some incredible research that we wanted to bring forward and use their names in naming these new streets and buildings coming forward. Obviously, you learn a lot when you talk to people, understanding what uh, people like to do, what children like to do, what um, fences mean to them, where they can kick balls, where they meet their friends, where they can throw things down from a balcony from a certain height uh, and communicate. And that dialogue helped us to understand that this helped us to understand this ambiguity between fronts and backs <coughs> being something that was productive and we could engage with. So where the building is at the moment, the community hall there is going to move. So we're building on that site. So we're looking at what's around in order to think about how to place the building and thinking about what ground floor activity means. We're thinking about where activity happens, upper level, lower level, and where you have flank walls or limited overlooking on the street. And then what we're doing here is making, a, it's like a kind of, I mean, Simon talked about a palazzo earlier. It's not really a palazzo. It's, it's a kind of block. It's a compressed block with a little courtyard in it. It's like a microcosm of the courtyard blocks. And what it does is it makes, we were, anyway, we were really interested in making the streets and the spaces around uh, create the identity of the building. So on the south, you have a racing island, you have an estate shortcut, you have a play street, and you have private gardens, and you have an atrium in the middle. And something here was that we didn't want an active frontage on the ground floor. We didn't think that people would want to be close to where children would play. So we lift people up to the, f the first floor, uh, and then we use, that we block the road off, and we use this blue colour of the Hackney bollards, which we didn't like actually, we didn't like the blue. But then when we gathered all the bollards together and reused the furniture, suddenly we liked the blue because it was definite. It wasn't about the colour, it was about the, the use of the colour. Uh, and I always find that fascinating, there's, there's no bad colour, it's just about the context. And we can, I'm happy to be challenged on that, but I just think all colours are good depending where they go. Um, Here's the racing island, that's the entrance into the atrium. There's a seat there and there's a plaque with the name on it there. So there's, it's a bit like someone sort of left things next to the wall, like people dump their, their sort of sofa. There's something contingent, uh, street scale, you could say, whereas the, whereas the building is a kind of an urban block. Uh, and this one actually uses a basement, so there's a kind of more rubbly, rough uh, quality to that. And then as you move into the atrium, there's this sort of, uh, well, do we call it, atrium's not a good word, is it? It's a kind of courtyard, really. Uh, it's a courtyard. Um, again, Simon talked earlier about fire escapes, and Stephen did, um, turning into something generous, balcony access. That's what we're trying to do here, where the units are all double aspect, open to the sky. You can see people, uh, and it's oval. And on the ground, we wondered about the geometries of moving to the staircases and the lifts and this sort of sense of being in that space. We don't expect people to hang around in that space for a lot of time, but there's something really interesting about the ground and the upper floors doing completely different things with the same geometry. Upstairs you have a kind of relatively repeated rational plan, 
which asks for all of the rooms to be working together. And we push the lobby as much as possible to be a space which you could use, not just move through. And then on the gallery area, the windows, the, the, so they're all double aspect and the window gives on to the uh, balcony, which uh, balcony like walkway, but the window mullions are quite deep. So if you're coming from the side, so, so you're not constantly seen by people coming along from the sides, you'd have to stand out the window and kind of look directly in to really kind of get eye to eye contact, which people tend not to do unless they've got some sort of intentions. Interior spaces. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's a street, and then that's a kind of urban block infill. This one is a sort of assemblage of a different sort of group of buildings. Um, we were working here, as we often do on the public realm and landscape, and one of the buildings is part of a master plan, in this case with Alford Hall and Monaghan Morris, 250 homes. We did this building nearest to us, which is the affordable rent building. Uh, and first of all, this was about doing a drawing that really picks up on the character of the place, the wild, rough, uh, canal-like spaces, which don't necessarily transmit to the streets which is on the edge of a conservation area. So in a way, this is walking, it's one of those so-called hairy drawings, maybe. I don't really know what hairy drawings means anymore, but it doesn't matter too much. <laughs> it's a bit like, but maybe what's, what's worth saying is that when you're drawing, it's really great not to know where you're going always, you, you, or how far you're going to go, or what you're going to find. That, that thing of putting stuff down means that when you draw a bollard, you realise maybe that's interesting for the building, or if you're drawing... The utility cover that's interesting thing about the services and the materials and then basically you can use it you can use it to help you design and also to lessen how much you have to invent i think we invent too much because there's everything we can do to curate organize it and and put together and again we've seen a lot of that this morning and i think that's much more exciting to organize to put together Putting together here was linked uh, here it was um, a street. Was that the pointer? Yeah, no. Okay. Doesn't matter. There's a street down the middle, connects to the water, that's new. That means that suddenly you can feel that you're next to the water inland, uh, which is this. And so what's going on is you have um, a kind of little street which is populated with bike stores, gardens, front doors. Uh, and it's actually quite a lively space now that then leads on to the space at the front where in order to deal with a once in a hundred years flooding, which I think rehearsed itself quite recently actually, there's some big floods going on here, the steps have to actually take that amount of water. So it's sunken down. So this, this is a challenge. This needs to kind of uh, still be occupied at the moment. But what it does do is it extends the space of the canal edge fairly seamlessly without another row of fencing to make one landowner meet another. And I must say that is a complete triumph, not to put another fence in. But you don't notice it. You don't think about it unless you have to. That's a bollard. <clears throat> and then we were looking at these warehouses which have this really strong quality holding the street down. <clears throat> the one on the right, noticeably, does something quite interesting as it turns the corner. It somehow changes floor height and window dimensions, not, not in a very strong way, but in quite a soft way, given it's such a strong block. Uh, and we wanted to take that corner turning capability on because you'll usually see this building from two sides. It's uh, 15 affordable rent units, a mixture of two and three beds. And you have access to the car park, which goes underneath the building. It's a little commercial unit, and there's the residential entrance. And the ledges that you see in this drawing are a way of registering the kind of different scales of the building uh, from one side to the other. It shifts up and down, and you feel like you can sit on the Bream Street one, but on the Stour one, it's a bit like it's lifted up and you can walk underneath it. it makes the building look a bit bigger, 
a little bit stronger, even though, but, but at the same time allows for the rationality of repeated bedrooms, which have to be affordable. <clears throat> this was a drawing of a model, just trying to think about the faces of this building, what it had to do. And this building is next to Foreman's Fish Factory, so we thought we could simply reflect that it had a salmonness. We had some more complicated ideas about this, but somehow salmon colour was enough. It's inflected, it's next to the salmon factory, it allows for a kind of fire gap if they ever build something there. And it gives something that feels like it's scooped out and it's maybe slightly partially complete. I think there is something about architects and architecture that is over total, too, to too, too, too much totalness, <laughs> too finished, too entire. And I think leaving things open often feels like it's interested in the city around and it's often uh, available in ways which are not determined but you know it's open to interpretation it's, it's uh, wanting to engage and to join in uh, the top of this building crumples into a kind of slightly squashed star and looks around because it's higher up and it's got the ability to do that and so it's quite different depending where you stand where you move around um, there are often things in the way cars in the way but I like the fact that it's, um, it's quite rough. It's already got graffiti and uh, had some uh, <clears throat> things applied to its face and it doesn't really, doesn't really matter. Well, it does matter a bit, but it can be dealt with, can't it? <clears throat> uh, last one, Royal Street. So this is really uh, a public realm and landscape project. I would call it an urban project in a way because what we often do is to try to assert a shape, a character, an extent, an attitude to space, which then influences architects we're working with or colleagues or comes out of a part of a conversation um, so that we're not just filling in some toothpaste between some gaps of other buildings, but we're having a conversation about what it means to have public space as part of a substantial development. And this one, you can see the site, is in an incredible part of London in Waterloo, near Waterloo Station, Archbishop's Park is to the south and you're on the bend of the river. One of the beautiful things about this part of London is you've got this sweep of the river and on the south side in the 17th and 18th century you have something very marsh-like. You have um, tracks and rafts and walkways spread across muddy land in order to allow people to come and grow crops or give access to gardens or move around and start to develop buildings. The Archbishop's Palace itself felt like it was tethered to the river, floating. Um, and so really, we love this idea that, and, and this, scheme, this, this scheme is for Stanhope, it's a big scheme, there are several architects working on it, um, uh, Meditech uses, mixed use, but Meditech, uh, big chunky buildings. And this runs between, I suppose, what we felt that was that we had to enhance the, the, the experience of this. It was all about experience. It's taking on the kind of physical, um, the, the, the herbs, the, the physical qualities of the um, tradescents who brought in um, planting that was to do with um, health and exoticness and uh, gardens and starting to actually make this something that people would feel part of as a community. So this is really setting some rafts and planks and roots through between these buildings and lifting them up so that you feel like you're stepping above the landscape and getting to other parts of the landscape and you're starting to measure the distances and you start to be able to use the section of the land, the significance of the marsh which you'd sink into up to your knees maybe in the 17th century. Um, and you take some pleasure in traversing the landscape. And so the planting strategy is something that's kind of a bit like the Garden Museum. It's got this kind of beautiful, rich, productive community quality. Um, and so, okay, so then you're making your way through these buildings. And these sketches are really, it's a massive area. You've got Lambeth Road, Lambeth Palace Road, and you've got the railway, and then you've got Archbishop's Park at the south, and then you've got kind of Waterloo Roundabout at the north. And it's trying to sort of say that those, those areas are 
having an influence on the materiality, because that's what I'm meant to be talking about, materiality, I think, and um, <clears throat> reasons why you might use extensive materials. So on the left, Lambeth Palace is a footway. It's a busy road, so we make the footway more generous, and it's, it splodges in a little bit. And then you've got the railway, which is bricky and concretey, so we use bricks and concrete. And then in the middle, you've got these rafts and sunken gardens and uh, platforms. And then we get through the buildings into Archbishop's Park with some gardens. I should mention that Simon... Uh, is designing a very nice building just there in the southeast, a residential building. We collaborated very closely with him on that, which is good. I wanted to mention collaboration because Tim raised it so nicely. It, it is a crucial element of all of this. So then you start to kind of get a picture of a material palette that is spatially specific, manageable, not too expensive, but meaningful in some way. And it starts to kind of add up to a series of spaces which uh, then give you a hard landscape strategy, a soft landscape strategy. Tree planting makes sense. It's about signifying where you are, inviting you in, seeing colour, giving scale, and then furniture and objects sort of start to come in. So this is quite an early stage. So this is a kind of layering of the public realm and, and obviously wanting to think about what's happening on the ground floor. And then the plan comes out that looks like this. And there are other things to say about it. But what I wanted to just touch on briefly, I'm nearly finished, <clears throat> is that out of that kind of conversation about getting through the site, dealing with straightforward highways and roads, and, and the interface with Archbishop's Park, what happens is you start, to, the more you look, you realise these are all bloody huge spaces. They're not just streets and gardens, they're massive projects. And so the closer you look, the bigger the scale bit kind of gets. Um, and you realise that you need to start to think seriously about what does this space actually do? You know, this is next to the park. What we said was we'd reuse materials as much as possible from some of the buildings. And there's a building there being demolished which we wish wouldn't be demolished, but it's going to be demolished. There is a building there which will be reused, which is an impressive, it's uh, in uh, Joe Morris's uh, plot. And I hope that happens. It's sort of like, how do we work the carbon out? But it looks like it could go that way. Um, and so we're thinking seriously about reusing materials. These layerings, these gardens, as you move through, you get places of quiet um, trees, burbling water, Moving down towards Archbishop's Park, there's a little cafe building there that we see at the end. Next to the viaduct, you have this new uses. Field and Fowls are doing those spaces under there. Um, and then you get these rafts going through, through the middle um, and this sense of adventure uh, and little bridges that go into the ground floors of these buildings. And, and something that doesn't correspond with the geometry of the buildings, but pushes the buildings away as if there are heavy boulders that sunk into the marsh. And then this was one of those landings where you get the raft that lands on the, this spot where you've got a landing. And here this was reusing Beckett House's cladding in the ground. I think that's going to be tricky. I think it's not going to work. But it seemed that we needed another scale, a, a little scale, things you could touch and sit on. So I thought that maybe I could go beachcombing across the other side of the river and find things that we could then make furniture out of. And that would be a credible degree of innovation, continuity, reuse, or just silliness, I don't know. But um, these were the things that were found, and these are the things that we will turn into seats and playthings and objects sprinkled into that space. That's it, thank you.